What's the difference between a mass murderer and a terrorist? And who decides? Why newsrooms are wrestling with the words. Those are shots! Run! Those are shots! A grim record has been broken. Another mass shooting, this one now, the worst in U.S. history. It's, it's a sad situation, but it's our job to tell some of those stories. We don't know uh, his motivation. We don't know whether it was political, religious, or a grudge of some sort. Was he acting as a lone wolf? The attacks in Edmonton that police are treating and investigating as acts of terrorism. We as journalists think really hard before we use words. Words have meaning. I'm Diana Swain. We're the investigators. This is what we do. It's been a rough week. Even the best journalists have struggled to find words to describe it. But why aren't they describing the shooting deaths of dozens of people as an act of terror? Oh, those poor people. Everybody was just running. He didn't have to be a good shot. It all happened just crazy fast. It seems not real. Positioned 32 floors above with a high-powered rifle, rounds of ammunition, and thousands of people trapped below, it was possible for the shooter to kill more people in one event than any other in modern U.S. history. Though even if he hadn't killed himself, it's unlikely he'd be charged with terrorism offenses because his motives remain unclear. Investigators say they don't know why Paddock came to the hotel to kill. This week in Quebec, it was decided the case against Alexandre Bissonnette will go directly to trial. Terrible attack at a mosque in Canada. Last January, he is alleged to have shot dead six Muslim men who were praying in a Quebec City mosque. Absent any specific ties to radical groups, he has not been charged with terrorism offenses. Carnage on the streets of Canada overnight. Last Sunday in Edmonton, a police officer was run down and then stabbed. His attacker then hit four others. Though the suspect still hasn't been charged with terrorism offenses, police were quick to say this fit the description of a terrorist attack. Police say a crumpled ISIS flag was found in the car. Police are treating and investigating as acts of terrorism. Is it only terrorism if ties to an extremist group can be found? Can anyone argue those who ran for their lives in Vegas didn't feel terrorized? And who decides what we call it? Indira Lakshmanan is with the Pointer Institute. So, Indira, we have three distinct examples with one profound difference. Do you see a difference there that's meaningful? Well, sure. I mean, first of all, I have to say that I wrote about this for Pointer um, because, you know, I think it's important that we as journalists think really hard before we use words. Words have meaning. And at least what happens in this country is that the media, as well as authorities and politicians, tend to jump to the conclusion that if a Muslim brown person carries out an attack, um, it's very quick to appear in the headlines that this was somehow linked to terrorism, whereas if a white person carries out a similar attack, they're much more likely to call him a lone wolf, deranged. Um, in this case, the sheriff in Las Vegas used the word distraught, um, but not link it explicitly to terrorism. This certainly comes off as potentially being biased, but there's a deeper question here, which is the legal definition. Both in the United States and in Canada, the criminal code definition of domestic terrorism involves that it not just leaves people feeling terrorized, but that there also be a political motivation or links to an extremist group. So this is why you've seen, um, you know, the hesitation in calling, for example, Bissonnette in Quebec City a terrorist or Paddock in Las Vegas a terrorist because authorities have not yet established any ties um, that I know of to terrorist groups or political motivation in those cases. So, but getting to that point, it, as I was saying a moment ago, the people in Vegas must have felt terrorized. Does the word have any real value anymore or does it become a kind of a dog whistle word? You know, that's a great question, because to feel terrorized is, of course, something that I think one feels from any kind of a violent attack. It doesn't matter what the motivation is. So in our sort of common parlance, certainly we would all consider that terrorism. That's different, of course, from the legal definition, which does involve that it also has to have some purpose of coercing the government or influencing policy under the U.S. criminal code. Um, I think the larger problem is that, of course, how we write and speak 
speak about violent attacks in the news shapes public perceptions. And if we are quick to associate Muslim assailants with terrorism um, and not so quick to associate white perpetrators, um, it certainly creates a perception. Very quickly, I want to look at the guidance that CBC journalists are given when trying to figure out when to use the word. And, and this is a bit of a summary because it's, frankly, it's about a page long, the guidance that we get. But among that is avoid labeling any specific bombing or other assault as a terrorist act unless the term is attributed. Also, don't judge specific acts as terrorism or people as terrorists. Instead, simply describe the actor individual and let the viewer, the listener, the reader decide. In your view, is that adequate guidance, or do we need to be adjusting this as this issue comes up again and again? Honestly, I think that's excellent guidance, and it's probably a lot stronger and more explicit than the guidance most of us have in U.S. news organizations, um, where it's more sort of up to the individual reporter and their editors to determine how they're going to use it. Um, you know, CBC is a, is a large and publicly supported institution, and it makes sense to me that you would have explicit guidance. And that, to me, seems pretty clear, that you should describe the legal actions of what the person has done rather than labeling them with what has become essentially a colloquial term that, in some ways, as you suggested, has lost meaning, but still carries, uh, you know, a stigma and public perception, and rightfully so, of course, if something is um, terrorism and extremist-oriented. Indira, thank you for your time. Thanks so much for having me. And we all thought it was firecrackers. And then it kept on going, and then he quiet for a bit, and then he fired another 15, 20 rounds, and that's when he realized it was a fully automatic. Those early moments of a breaking news situation are critical for journalists. And there were no shortage of network journalists in Las Vegas that night. They were already there to cover the story of the release of O.J. Simpson. Nothing has changed in my life. What do you guys, I mean, what do you expect? But it's local reporters who know where to go when a story breaks. They're the ones with established relationships with local police and first responders. Avoid this area. Uh, please do so while police uh, work. Ricardo Torres is a crime reporter with the Las Vegas Sun. He was at home getting ready for bed just before 11 when he got the call about an active shooter on the strip. Help him and call him! Within moments, he was in his car, heading towards a story that's still making headlines. Given the scope of what he encountered, how did he know where to start? So, Ricardo, take us through the night. You're racing toward the scene. As reporters, we've all been in that position, but you never know what you're about to encounter, and certainly not that the story you're running towards is one that's going to dominate headlines around the world for days. What did you see when you first got there? Um, I... Got in through a backside road uh, parked nearby at the MGM Grand. Um, it was like I got there about an hour after the reports first started. Um, and I saw people were still running away from the scene down uh, Tropicana Road, um, which is where the MGM Grand is. And uh, there were people crying. There were people on their phone uh, trying to get in touch with uh, other people while they were running. Uh, paramedics had set up uh, some sort of triage. I ended up at the Tropicana Hotel with a lot of the survivors. And what was your first instinct? People often wonder when a reporter arrives at a scene like that, what is job one for you? Is it trying to figure out what's happening? Is it talking to people who are running? What was your first instinct? Uh, the adrenaline rush is uh, so strong that uh, you don't really know what to do. I uh, recorded video. Uh, but I was trying to figure out what to do first. Like, do I tweet a picture? Do I record video? Uh, do I try talking to people? Uh, do I try finding out the official information? Um, I ended up recording uh, some video and then uh, followed it with a tweet. Those pictures are still so difficult for everyone to watch. Anyone can imagine themselves having been at that concert that night. When you first had a moment to just sort of be by yourself, to be quiet, to reflect on what you'd seen and what had happened in your hometown, what were your feelings then? You know, I still haven't had that moment. It's, uh, I've purposely been avoiding uh, having that alone time and not working or not reading up on the, on like the horrible uh, thing that happened. 
but uh, at times there are, there are times where you just feel overwhelmed. I like, can't uh, put my head around it yet. What's it like in your newsroom as everybody's kind of had to deal with something they never imagined would be a story they would cover? I haven't uh, been in the newsroom much. Uh, I've been covering the press conferences and going to events, but uh, the reporters we, were asking each other if we're doing fine, uh, if we're just checking up on us, and uh, uh, we, we we're sad. <laughs> it's it's a sad situation, but it's our job to tell some of those stories. Ricardo, thanks for telling your story. I appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up. A Radio Canada investigation reveals dozens of members of the Canadian military are also members of a private Facebook page run by a far-right group. We'll ask the reporter who broke the story how the Canadian Forces is responding. That's next. But first, speaking in front of a big audience can be daunting, especially when you're Britain's Prime Minister asking for your party's forgiveness for a bad election campaign. And as speeches go, this one was bumpy. And prepare for a run on the ground. That was a comedian trying to give Theresa May a British version of a pink slip called a P45. She gamely tried to make light of it. I was about to talk about somebody I'd like to give a P45 to, and that's Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah! Nice save, but the fates were not finished. <coughs> <coughs> The director could only stay on the wide shot so long. <coughs> so, why, <coughs> why we will never, <coughs> excuse me. Eventually, someone gave her a lozenge. And just when it seemed the worst was behind her, well, watch what happens behind her. Right. That was shared around the globe. As attempts to impress go, she at least demonstrated temerity. But after three strikes, she may be out. Here are five things we learned this week from investigative journalists. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson called President Trump a moron and considered resigning amid growing disputes within the White House, according to reporting by NBC News. Tillerson later addressed the allegation, saying he has never considered stepping down. The man accused of perpetrating a pair of attacks in Edmonton last weekend had originally been ordered deported back to Somalia from the U.S. in 2011. The following year, Abdullahi Hassan Sharif was granted refugee status in Canada. Vice News was first to report the story. The Center for Investigative Reporting revealed some judges in the U.S. are sending defendants to work camps for private industry instead of sending them to jail. The program was designed to keep nonviolent offenders out of jail, but defendants liken it to slavery. An Ontario woman discovered the house she bought had been the site of a marijuana grow up, resulting in more than $30,000 in cleanup costs. CBC Go Public reported that attempts to implement grow up registries have failed across the country. And Ivanka Trump and her brother Donald Jr. were close to being charged with fraud for misleading prospective buyers interested in one of the family's hotels. But a joint investigation by ProPublica, New York Public Radio, and The New Yorker revealed the investigation was dropped after a visit from a Trump lawyer. The Canadian military warned its members this week to be careful about which groups they join on social media. That's because of an investigation by our colleagues of Radio Canada. It found dozens of military members were on the private Facebook page of Quebec's largest far-right group called Le Moot, or the Wolf Pack. The group is vocal about what it sees as creeping Islamic fundamentalism in Canada and strongly opposed to illegal immigration. Its leaders insist the group is not racist, but in the ultra-nationalist messaging, some signs are hard to miss. Started by former soldiers, the group claims over 40,000 members. But this week, CBC News revealed more than 70 members of the group are currently in the military, some seen in photos in their military uniform. This is Canada. It might have been, been McMahon. So you don't have Canadian ID? You don't... 
This past summer, five soldiers and other members of a far-right group known as the Proud Boys disrupted an indigenous protest in Halifax. The men were given unspecified disciplinary measures and put on probation. But within a matter of months, they were back on regular assignment. I don't have a, a huge surplus of people in the Canadian Armed Forces who have already spent millions of dollars training. Everybody, all of us, hit walls in our life they will work to restore the trust between them and their chain of command. So how seriously is the Canadian Forces taking the issue of potential racism in the ranks? Kathy Sine is the Radio Canada reporter who broke the story. So Kathy, let me begin with how did you find out? How did you learn about this? Well, I've been uh, covering military affairs since 2006. I've been, uh, I went in Afghanistan to cover the Canadian mission. I was incorporated with the Canadian Army. So I knew, I saw military members uh, becoming negative about that mission as I was there uh, because they were losing friends uh, with the attacks with the Taliban and then becoming Islamophobic, like coming back with Islamophobic feelings. So I knew at some point that some military members would be more easily attracted uh, to right-wing uh, radical groups such as Lamut, and Lamut was funded by ex-military soldiers as well. So you had a sense that there was discontent among active military members, but how did you find out about this particular story? So basically, uh, I found out uh, the tools which I cannot tell you exactly what they were, to basically investigate in, in the private uh, Facebook of Lamut. And basically, I was able to uh, uh, make a, a comparison between what I found out in Lamut Secret and was I, what I was able to find out as names and profiles in Facebook. So it was basically a well-documented research that took like several weeks. and. The reason why I'm, I cannot tell you what the tools are or what my methodology is is because you want to protect this. You want to protect your sources. You want to protect the way that you work. You want to protect the, the co-workers that help you because basically investigation, journalism investigation is all about teamwork and you just want to protect this. Is there any indication at this point whether disciplinary action is going to be taken? Actually, what the sense that I got from the uh, Canadian Army in Quebec is that this story had fostered the discussion about whether or not it's appropriate for a military member to be a part of a uh, radical group, whether or not it's right wing or uh, left wing. And I think there was like a kind of a, it was unclear really the orders were not that clear about it and this is why uh, the colonel fuller was the interview with him was so interesting because for him it was crystal clear that if a military member is a part of a group a radical group that is not respecting the code of values and ethics of the uh, canadian forces and the national defense it's totally forbidden. So, so far this is what we know. Uh, and it's not clear to me at this point that any uh, disciplinary measures can be taking place. And, you know, Diana, it can be just a simple warning to any military member that was part of, La of Lamoud, for example. Kathy, thanks for your time. Thank you. Coming up. Everybody go! When the images get to be too much, it's not only you that wants to tune out. Journalists would often like to do the same. Why sticking it out is good for all of us. My POV, just ahead. How many children are dying in care in New Brunswick? How are they dying and could their deaths have been prevented? Last season, we spoke to CBC New Brunswick's Carissa Donkin about a years-long investigation into child death reviews. At least 56 children known to Child Protection Services in New Brunswick have died of unnatural causes over the past two decades. Most of those deaths were never publicly explained. I think the only way to really change any of this is real transparency. So what happened next? Here's Carissa Donkin. Diana, when we first spoke, the government here in New Brunswick was still defending the child death review system, saying it's excellent the way it is now. But the tone has begun to shift a little bit, and the government seems to finally be acknowledging that people want to know more. And earlier this year, the government announced a review. 
It's supposed to look at how we can make the child death review system here a bit more transparent. We don't know exactly what that will look like yet, but the review is expected to be completed by the end of this year. Now, in the meantime, we also saw a special tribute for a little girl who was featured in our Lost Children series. Diana, you may remember the name Jackie Brewer. She was only two years old when her parents left her to die alone inside a St. John room. Her death actually prompted the creation of this entire child death review system. And more than 20 years ago, a judge called for a public monument for Jackie, so people would never forget her. But her death did seem to be forgotten over the years, and that changed back in September, when a monument was unveiled for Jackie inside a St. John playground. Thanks for the update, Carissa. If you're watching this program, you're probably someone who regularly watches the news. And if you watched over the past week, it was a tough one. Our colleagues at the Fifth Estate told the searing stories of those who've escaped torture in Syria's jails and of those who didn't make it out. There was the audible gasp when we all saw footage of Edmonton police officer Mike Chernick being violently thrown into the air and then stabbed by his attacker. And Vegas, so much panic, and fear, and even if we ever learn the motive, will it really matter? If you were tempted to just turn it all off, who could blame you? But if you stuck with it, as journalists who stuck with the story did, you will have seen that light finally peek out from behind black clouds. Hey. <laughs> How you doing? Vegas bartender Justin Uhart, who saved Jan Lamborn of Manitoba after she was shot, got to see her in the hospital. Their reunion was powerful, and there wasn't a dry eye in the newsroom when that video came in. Hockey fans in Edmonton were on their feet Wednesday night as Chernick surprised them by walking out on the ice, showing everyone that he's okay. In those first moments of even awful events, journalists are powered by adrenaline and a job to do. We have to cover those moments of madness. But the moments of humanity are just as important, and we needed to see them just as badly as you did. We're glad you kept watching. I'm Diana Swain. We are The Investigators.